last tutorial, we looked at the big picture of language and meaning and all the factors that help us to create and share meaning when we communicate with someone else. Now we're going to focus on semantics, which is the structured system of meaning within individual languages. It is the way the grammar and lexicon of a language construct meaning in words and sentences and the way parts of sentences relate to each other in terms of meaning. A native speaker of a language has an unconscious knowledge of the operation of meaning in their language. They know, without thinking about it, how to use grammar to build meaning, and they unconsciously control the relationship between meanings of words and phrases. But, because it is a structured system that follows particular rules and patterns, we can look at the semantics of a language and see how that system works. Semantics is the part of grammar that tells us there is a special relationship between short and tall in a way that there isn't between short and forgetful. It tells us that it's impossible to meet a man who wasn't there because the meaning of the word meet means the person who gets met must be present. Semantics tells us that a giant turtle larger than a house is okay. Unusual, but okay in a sci-fi movie but it rules out a giant hill larger than a mountain, even though normal hills already are much larger than turtles, because the word hill includes in its meaning that it's smaller than a mountain, while the word turtle does not include anything in its meaning about its relationship in size to houses. For a native speaker, each word or expression in their language has a lot of information attached to it. For instance, they know how to pronounce it, they know how it operates in the syntax, they know the variety of possible meanings it has, and they know how it interacts with other words or expressions to change its meaning in certain circumstances. All of this information about words and expressions is stored in the mental lexicon of the speaker of the language. The lexicon is a store of all the relevant information about words and expressions that a person needs to know to be able to use them correctly to convey meaning. This semantic information about each word or expression, which is also called a lexeme, is contained in the mental lexicon of each language. When we talk about meaning, we're usually talking about something called denotation. Denotation is the literal meaning of a word or sentence. When we say the word dog, it denotes an entity in the world that we could refer to as a canine animal. Denotation is the linguistic form's descriptive or literal meaning. As well as having a literal meaning, words or expressions can also have other meanings or connotations. Connotation refers to the emotional associations, the social overtones or cultural implications that are part of the meaning of a word or expression over and above its purely descriptive content. Words convey more than their exact literal meanings. They connote or suggest additional meanings and values as well. Sometimes, because of usage over time, words that denote approximately the same thing they always did may acquire additional meanings or connotations that are either positive or negative. Consider the changes undergone in the connotations of these words in the 20th century. Liberal, diversity, right-wing, follower, gay, minority, feminist, left-wing, abuse, conservative, motherhood, extremist, rights, partner, harassment, family, propaganda, peacekeeper and comrade. Sometimes, words or expressions also connote social meaning. The social meaning of a linguistic form is what that form tells the hearer about the social characteristics of the speaker, their class, level of education, gender, regional background, ethnicity, and so on. For example, in Australia, if I said to some friends, are you going to come over with us or what? I would probably be considered rough and assumptions might be made about my class or education. It could make some people uncomfortable, but others may feel more comfortable with me. There are a lot of social meaning connotations that can be made when we hear someone's speech, 
things like their age, gender, regional background, ethnicity or subculture. The effective meaning of a linguistic form tells the hearer about the attitudes of the speaker. It can tell you how they feel about what they're talking about just by the words they choose. For example, choosing one or other of, the w of these words show a different attitude. If you said brave or if you said reckless, strong-willed versus pig-headed, fat versus well-built, police officer versus constable versus cop versus pig, skinny versus slender. Factors such as stress and intonation can also show effective meaning. Sarcasm can be expressed just by using a different intonation. You could say, oh yeah, that was a really clever thing to do. Or you could say, oh yeah, that was a really clever thing to do. In any language, separating grammatical denotation from connotation is important because while you might understand a word's denotation, knowing a word's connotations and what they're intended for is much more difficult to know. Connotations are often emotional in nature and if they're intended, it could be for any number of purposes. To sway opinion one way or another, to communicate personal identity or to share a deep feeling. If there are misunderstandings about how a person is using a particular word, a primary source of that misunderstanding might lie in the word's connotations. People might be seeing something not intended, or the speaker may be intending something that people didn't see. In cross-cultural communication, it's obviously extremely important not merely to look at what your words or others' words denote, but also what they connote. Let's have a look at semantic relations and we'll start with polysemy and homonymy. Now this sounds complicated, but it actually isn't. Homonymy or polysemy just refer to the fact that one group of sounds can have more than one meaning. Homonyms are unrelated lexemes that just happen to have the same form. So we have bank of a river versus a bank as in a financial institution. Keep meaning to retain, plus keep meaning the keep of a castle. You can have the bow of a boat or to bow meaning to bend forward. Homophones are homonyms that are pronounced the same regardless of how they're written. So you can have bow of a boat and bow the branch of a tree, but they're spelt differently. We can say I meaning myself versus I as in the part of you that sees two meaning towards, or two meaning also. Homographs are homonyms that are written the same way regardless of whether they're pronounced the same. So you can have wind that blows and wind meaning to twist. You can have the bow of a, bow of a boat versus a bow for arrows. Many homonyms are both a homophone and a homograph. So bank and bank are both. Bow of a boat and bow for arrows are homographs, but not homophones. Polysemy involves a word that has more than one meaning, but they are different senses of the same word. A single lexeme may have several meanings. For example, bank can mean a financial institution, a building, the dealer and distributor of money in gambling games, to deposit money in a financial institution, to depend on, and so forth. Other examples would be mouth, so you can have the mouth of a river or the mouth of a person, or lose, to lose a football match or to lose your keys. The lexical information for words such as bank contains information that this lexeme has several senses, various closely related and overlapping meanings that it can have. An example of polysemy in Bengali is the word matai. In these examples here, the Bengali word mapai is used in three different senses. So firstly, it means top of a table. In the second example here, it implies the mind of a person. And in the third example, it indicates the beginning of a day. So in Bengali, these senses are concepts that are related in meaning. And mapai is considered to be one lexeme that can be used to express many different senses more than are illustrated in our examples here. 
All right, now for antonymy and synonymy. Words or utterances that have the same meaning are synonyms. Some examples of synonyms are quick and fast, big and large, movie and film, rent and hire. Synonyms may belong to different registers, so they would be used by different people in different situations. So you could have hubby versus husband versus spouse, pets versus companion animal, grabbed versus nicked versus apprehended, mouth versus oral cavity, tell versus inform, or police officer versus cop. Synonyms may have different connotative meaning, so people would choose the one that best expressed their meaning. So, police officer versus pig again, talked versus droned on versus enthralled, brave versus reckless, swamp versus wetlands. Synonyms may be used in different linguistic situations. So, with rented and hired, they rented or hired a car, but you would say they rented a house, whereas they hired a new receptionist. The synonyms pair and couple, you could say a pair of dogs or a couple of dogs, but you would say a pair of trousers and a couple of dollars. Synonyms may have different semantic range as well. So boss and employer, if you work in a small business, your boss may also be your employer. In a large organisation, your boss may be a fellow employee who is your manager, while your employer is the organisation, which you would not refer to as your boss. Synonyms may have different dialectal or sociolectal distribution, so they may be used in different regions or by different groups in society. So, for example, we have footpath versus sidewalk versus pavement. We have couch, sofa settee or lounge. What about chap, fellow, bloke or dude? Or you might say gun, piece, weapon or sidearm. Words or utterances that have the opposite meaning are antonyms. So some examples of antonyms are quick and slow, big and small, hot and cold. Some antonyms are complementary which means that they are absolute and mutually exclusive and mean the exact opposite of one another. So, for example, alive versus dead, married versus unmarried, hit versus miss. So one rules out the other. If something is alive, that means that it is not dead. So part of the meaning of dead is not alive. We could say that a pair of complementary antonyms exhausts the full range of possibilities Something is either one or the other. But some antonyms are gradable antonyms. These are antonyms, but they have shades or degrees of meaning between them. So big versus small. A mouse might be big in relation to a flea, but small in relation to a cow. New versus old. Or hot versus cold. A cup of coffee might be hot compared to ice, but cold compared to magma. A cup of coffee can be a bit hot or not very hot. One cup of coffee can be hot, another can be hotter, and yet another the hottest. Some words have opposite meanings that are reverses. So for example, push versus pull, or increase versus decrease. Some pairs of words have converse meanings. These kinds of words are converses or relational opposites. So mother versus daughter. If Linda is Dania's mother, then Dania is Linda's daughter. Or buy versus sell. If Paul sells the car to Bob, then Bob buys the car from Paul. Some individual words may have their own converse meanings too. For example, rent. If Jim rents a house to Simon, Simon rents the house from Jim. We saw that with polysemy, one word, one lexeme stored in our minds can have several closely connected meanings. But there is another possibility if a word seems to have two meanings. It could be that one of the meanings is the literal or real meaning, and the other is using the word to refer to something else, knowing that it is not really what we are saying. This second kind of use is a metaphor, so let's look at some examples. 
a wave of emotion swept over him. We all know what a wave is, a moving wall of water, and what swept means, and what over means, but when we say that sentence, we don't mean that a wall of something moved across the top of the person. A metaphor is simply using a word that means one thing to refer to something else. We use metaphors because we want to suggest that in some way it is like the thing it normally refers to. A wall of water in the ocean is something bigger than us that we can't control, and emotion can be that way as well. So we use the metaphor of a sweeping wave to express that idea of helplessness. Also, we could say an idea hit him. We don't mean the idea punched him. We mean that when he thought of the idea, he thought of it suddenly and it had a big impact on him. The think that thinking of it was in some ways a bit like being punched. It had suddenness and impact. Some metaphors are so commonly used that we don't even notice them. For example, we often say, I see what you mean. Using see to mean understand is so common in English that we don't even notice it as a metaphor, and there are many of these in English. Metaphors don't need to just involve individual words. They can be organised into whole lexical domains or areas of meaning where one area is used to talk about another. One example of this is talking about time as if it was money. We might say, you're wasting my time. Is that worth your while? This gadget will save, your, save you hours. He's living on borrowed time. How do you spend your time? You don't use your time profitably. Or you need to budget your time. Another example is talking about ideas or plans as if they involved cooking. So we might say he's full of half-baked ideas. Or we've got that one on the boil. What scheme are you cooking up? or they put that plan on the back burner. Metaphors reflect cultural perspectives and different cultures use different metaphorical domains. For example, English treats the heart as the place in the body where emotion is. So we might say, he has a light-hearted attitude to life. The news left him with a heavy heart. They offered their heartfelt thanks. He's got a good heart. He's a brave-hearted fellow or they were heartbroken. In many other languages, emotion is located in the stomach or sometimes in the liver. For example, in Arta, a language from Papua New Guinea, you would say, my stomach is heavy to mean I'm sad. His stomach is trembling would mean he's afraid. My stomach is good would mean I'm okay at peace. Or it speared his stomach means it convicted him. An important source of metaphor involves spatial terms and terms for physical space are used as metaphors for many things. One important example is space as a metaphor for time. In some languages, the future is treated as in front and the past as behind. So some examples from English, we might say, I'm looking forward to the weekend. They're looking ahead to next year. He looked back over his life. They don't foresee any problems. The rest of your life is ahead of you. Put the past behind you where it belongs. Or Tuesday comes after Monday and before Wednesday. Time is treated like a path that you're travelling along. As you walk along a path, the part of the path you have not reached yet is physically in front of you, and the part of the path you have already walked along is physically behind you. But in some other cultures, it's the opposite. The past is thought of as in front of us and the future as behind us. Now, this might be hard to get your mind around because you've grown up using another metaphor to speak and think about time. But in some languages, ahead is a conventional metaphor for the past and behind for future. For example, in the Gurindji language from the Northern Territory, to say ahead or front means old, previous, and behind means younger or future. This metaphor is difficult for us to understand, but it makes sense to the Gurindji. It seems to be based on a scenario of travelling. Those that are ahead have already been here, and those behind have yet to reach here. Semantic relations, such as antonymy and synonymy, refer to the relationships between the stored meanings of words in the lexicon. 
There is another set of relations we have not looked at yet. The meanings of words grouped together into lexical fields. This is a little complex at first, but it's important to understand as it can be very different in different languages. So let's think about some examples. Pig, cat, lion and echidna have meanings that relate to each other because they all belong to the same lexical field, animals. Now we're going to use some new terminology here so we can talk about lexical fields and the way they work. Don't worry about memorising the specific terms. The main goal is for you to understand the concept of areas of meaning and how they work. Basically, words group together in different areas and levels of meaning. We will also be drawing diagrams to make it easier to understand. Now the superordinate for pig, cat, lion and echidna is animal. Each term in a lexical field is a hyponym of the superordinate. So pig is a hyponym of animal. The hyponyms of a single superordinate are sisters of, sisters of each other. So pig, cat, lion and echidna are sisters. A word can be a hyponym of one word, but the superordinate of another. For example, in this slide here, you can see that dog is a hyponym of animal, but it is itself the superordinate for Labrador, Poodle, Blue Heeler, and so forth. As you can see, word meanings form complex hierarchical sets of relations called taxonomies. A single word can fit into several different taxonomies in different ways. For example, if we think about a distinction between humans and animals, we might draw a taxonomy like this. But those who make no distinction might consider humans as a type of primate and would draw a different taxonomy, more like this. Taxonomies are cultural. Different cultures divide up the world differently. For example, in English, we would consider bird and bat to be separate taxonomies, with pigeon, chicken, uh, and parrot under the superordinate bird. But fruit bat and vampire bat we would not consider in that group. However, in Kokolta in the Solomon Islands, the word memeha is the superordinate for the taxonomy that includes all of these, chicken, pigeon, parrot, and also fruit bat and insectivorous bat. <laughs>